it's officially begun. Welcome back. Hello. Uh, let's see here. I have the course webpage up here because I have a couple of announcements. Um, I have been updating the first set of boxes here with resources. So I added this morning all of the documentation for the stuff I've used in R throughout the semester. Um, in this class, there's, that's basically going to be it. I don't know that I'm going to have to enroll any other ones, but if you're looking for um, more information than what's in my materials about how to use these packages, this is where I would direct you. I also just found this morning a tutorial about how to use LeVon that seems infinitely more readable than the documentation, so I thought I would post a link to that as well. Um, I have not yet re-recorded videos about how to use M+, but that's on my schedule for tomorrow because we're going to be starting to get into using M plus for uh, confirmatory factor analysis type models. The other things that I updated, um, so as a reminder, Thursday is the Zoom only day because we're being kicked out of this classroom so that they can have comprehensive exams. Office hours are this afternoon rather than yesterday at 3.30 and tomorrow's office hours have been moved to Thursday just for this week. After that, we'll be back to normal. I also posted in ICON your first formative assessment, which will be due next Monday night. And the reason that I have these due on Monday nights is so that Tuesdays I can read them all and go over your answers and then have a sense as to what I want to emphasize when we go over them in class. Uh, those of you who have not had me before, I do need to explain the last item on the formative assessment, as is my tradition. The question is, what is your theme song? So the idea is for me to get to know a little bit about your personalities. So the context is like if you played a professional sport, right, and you were being brought into the game or the match or the field, like what's the song that's playing when you're introduced? That's what I want to know. Um, I will build a playlist so that you can all uh, share each other's music on YouTube. I'll keep it private, but I'll circulate the link so that we can use it. And I do listen to these playlists while I try to exercise sometimes. So if you have any particular bangers that will help get me motivated to keep lifting weights or walking or whatever I'm doing, I would appreciate those. Uh, it can be any genre, any language, anything. A anything goes. Um, I also put up your very first homework, which is not due until the following Monday, the 19th. And it is a Word document that you can, you can uh, edit directly. So let me pull that up. It is to be submitted an icon, and I made a link for where it, is, it goes. But it is the idea of doing the background checking of whatever type of items you want to analyze. So your assignment is to figure out what you'd like to do for the rest of the class in terms of analyzing item level data. And then go find the original sources that describe the psychometrics of that scale or of that test. So I'm looking for you to literally just type in where it says answer, what the answers to the questions are. And so I'm asking for things like, who is the instrument designed for? What are they trying to measure? How are they doing it? And then in terms of the evidence that they provided with respect to their psychometrics, what did they tell you? and just basic kind of stuff like this. So this will help me when I'm reading your individual assignments to have some context, but it will also help you realize what has and what hasn't been done before. In particular, for instruments that were developed in like the 80s and 90s, odds are quite good that the original scale development paper was nothing more than an exploratory factor analysis and a calculation of alpha. Maybe some correlations for validity thrown in. For instruments that have been developed subsequently, um, it's likely that you might see a confirmatory factor analysis, but it's also likely that there are ordinal items for which that's not really appropriate. So this will have you help you get a sense as to what's been done and to how your efforts could potentially contribute to that literature. If there are things that they say they did that you don't know what that means, write that down here. Hopefully by the end of the semester you can look back at this and realize just how much you've learned. In reading and knowing how to read the methods section of the articles, the part that people typically skip when the stats part is really hard. So this, I got a couple of weeks to work on this. Shouldn't take very long. Um, eight points out of 100 for doing this. And I won't expect that you would need it. But if you do need to make a revision to get all of the points, that won't be due, let's see, uh, about a month later. So the 10th of October. There's a spot for submitting revisions if that would be necessary for you. Okay, 
So those are the scheduling things I wanted to point out. Any questions on any of that? No? Good so far? Zoomers? Good? I, I have a question. Hit so me. if we're using an instrument that doesn't have like a defined, like this is the whatever scale, mm -hmm. uh, some of these questions, should we just talk about what we think we, these items might measure? Does that make sense? I'm just skimming through the... Mm -hmm. Yeah, if it's something to where you don't have a strong literature basis for it, then you can you can write whatever makes the most sense. Great. If it's nothing more than like a white paper or something like that, then you know you can say they, they, they told us this part, they didn't include any information about that, and that's informative to know. So yeah, you're, you're, not necess you're not being judged on how complete the psychometrics are for the thing you've chosen. It's just a question, it's just an opportunity for both of us to get to know what have they done so far, and then that will guide what would be informative. Great. So, yeah. Thank you. Sure. Anything else before we uh, dive into some new stuff? It's the beginning of the CFA unit, and for those of you who have downloaded the new slides and said, 80 slides, this is going to take like a month, okay? I've just, I, I planned it on the schedule. This, this is going to take a while. And we'll, we'll go through it as, uh, in as many classes as it takes before it makes sense. So I have uh, this sort of, um, what do you call it, a roadmap sort of thing periodically throughout the presentation so we can keep track of, of where we are given how many slides there are. Um, the first part of it is contrasting EFA and CFA, which is going to be more useful to those of you who've had it before, but for those of you who haven't. Very briefly, exploratory factor analysis is what EFA stands for, and it is something that I will give you videos to watch and lecture slides about while I'm at uh, a conference in October. It, I think it will make more sense after you've been through CFA to see what the alternative is for EFA and how it, how it is or isn't different, but these are sort of the high points. So in exploratory factor analysis, the underlying idea is that you might tell the software, tell me what it would look like if I had one factor, two factors, three factors, four factors. You can give a range. And it spits out a solution in which every item is thought to be measured by every factor. And people would go through the size of the loadings for each factor to try and figure out what that factor must mean based on which items were loading most highly and which ones were not. And then you can decide, well, do I want all five factors or does it look like maybe I only need four? And then there's something called rotation that you can do to try and make the factors more interpretable. But you're starting from a place of complete a-theoretical specification that every item must measure everything. And odds are good, items weren't written that way. You might have a question as to whether an item measures this thing, that thing, or both, but it would rarely be the case that a priori it would be reasonable to think that every item measures every factor. So with that basic background, let me contrast very briefly how that differs from where we're headed. EFAs are based on correlation matrices. So they are matrix decomposition routines on correlation matrices for the most part. And where we are headed is we're going to examine means, variances, and covariances of items over time. So we will look at correlations as well, but we're sticking with the information in its original scale-sensitive form, such that differences in scale will matter. And I have a note here on terminology. So the term variances and covariances more formally is described by a variance-covariance matrix. That means that the variances are on the diagonal and the covariances are on the off-diagonals. I have tried to go through the slides and find every instance in which I took a shortcut and put that in, but if you hear me say covariance matrix, it means variances and covariances. It's just a shorthand way of saying it. But the key idea here is that what we are going to be working with in terms of the data to be modeled are the item means, the item variances, and their covariances. That's the data that we care about. Um, the means themselves, in CFA particularly, tend to have tended to be ignored. We're going to start with the min from the first get-go. 
That's one of the ways in which the way I present it differs from the Brown textbook. He relegates the means to a later chapter. Um, ironically, uh, on the back of the Brown textbook, there is a blurb with my name on it saying how much I like the book. I got to be one of the blurb people. And because I had done that, they gave me a, a chance to review the second edition. And I wrote like a six page single space review of how much I liked the book, but all the things I would probably change, none of them got changed. So the means stayed at the latter part of the book relative to what I had wanted. So I'm just gonna keep putting them right in the equation because they're there from the get go. Uh, the output that we will look at though, works with either covariances or correlations. And so there will be two different versions of the model given back to you in terms of its parameters. One version is designed to speak to the item means, variances, and covariances. That's called the unstandardized solution. The other version of the model parameters is going to refer to the correlations instead. That's known as the standardized version. And for those of you who went through regression, and learned about regression slopes versus standardized regression slopes, it's exactly that distinction. The item correlation matrix assumes all the means are zero, and it assumes all the variances are one. So we just focus on that part. In terms of interpretation, here is the problem that I have with EFA. You can have one person do an analysis and say, you know what, I think it looks like four factors, and with this rotation, this factor means this, and this factor means this, and I'm good. And someone else will say, no, 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 no. It's actually only three factors, and I took a different rotation, and now it means this, and this, and this. And you know what, they're both right. There is no mathematical or statistical way to decide which rotation is best. And there are actually papers from the 80s where people say, I collected data with this scale and I got four factors out of my EFA and then someone writes another paper and they're like, no, -uh, I only got three and they're both right. I just find that really dissatisfying to not have any basis of saying which model is preferable based on the data. Um, the other piece of it is that the factors are likely to be some amalgam of both the content of their items as well as the features of their items, such as whether it has positive wording or negative wording whether it has a common stem, whether it refers to some sort of common idea that's more specific than the general trait. And so the factors themselves don't have a ready interpretation as a consequence of all this being kind of mushed together. So my perspective is it's not your data's job to tell you what they measure. That's your job to figure that out. And most people, would, they would write items, do so with a purpose in mind, right? Like, I know what I'm trying to measure. These are the items that we wrote to try and measure it. Now I wanna see how well it works. So if you're starting from a place of knowing what you want to measure, why not start, start your modeling off effort with that same place? That's my perspective. So the difference in CFA is that everything is up to us. We decide which factors are measured by which items. We decide whether there should be correlations among the factors and whether the data support that decision. We decide if beyond the content factors, we need something that are called method factors, also known as bifactors in an IRT context, where you have a factor whose job it is to soak up extra relations between items because of something else, such as the way that they're worded. So the big misconception, I think, with respect to EFA and CFA is that you'll see a lot of well-meaning books and articles saying you have to do EFA first, but you don't. You can start with CFA. If you're wrong and you have to modify your structure to fit the data, then own up to it and get another sample and verify that the new structure you come up with fits this time. And each time that you mess with it, you would ideally want to get a new sample to show that your modifications are effective and, and would replicate. But it's our job in the first place. And even if you are wrong, what's nice about a CFA framework is that the information that you get back out of your analysis is diagnostic as to how you went wrong and how to fix it. So getting that diagnostic information is a really important step that takes it out of the traditional known as confirmatory, but within this framework, the information that it provides makes it much more useful than exp the exploratory analogs. In terms of judging model fit, 
There are pictures people make out of EFA uh, plots, with plotting eigenvalues and that kind of stuff. They decide whether an item is measuring a factor based on an arbitrary cutoff of a standardized loading of 0.3 or 0.4. And a lot of the older packages, such as like um, PROC Factor or SPSS, they don't have standard errors at all. The newer packages, like there are R packages that will add standard errors to your EFA, but if you know how to use R, odds are good you're not doing EFA in the first place. In CFA, we do all the usual inference via maximum likelihood. So that means that we will get indices of what are known as global model fit, the extent to which the factor structure that you've postulated is consistent with the data that you've collected. We will get standard errors and significance tests of all parameters, doesn't matter what kind, and we will be able to do model comparisons to see whether or not changing the model helps it fit better or fit not better or fit worse in some cases. So we can do all of the usual stats kinds of things through the magic of maximum likelihood. In this class, we will use a modified version of ML with an R at the end of it that stands for robust, but it's still the same thing. Factor scores out of EFA are hella problematic. Factor scores out of CFA can be used, but it's preferable not to. The point of doing a factor analysis is to not have to output factor scores. It's to be able to analyze whatever relationships among the factors that you care about with the factors in latent space. That's what it was designed for. If you do want to output factor scores, there has to be some way of also outputting the error around them and not pretending that they're perfectly reliable observed variables. So at the very end of the course, we will introduce options for when you can't do SEM and you have to work with factor scores. What are the choices? What are the pros and the cons? Because I live in the real world where we may not have samples of thousands of people with which to analyze our data. Okay, a little bit about that. So any questions on that much thus far? Cheers. Yes, sir. Can I just do like a mini summary of the difference? Sure. So what I gather is EFA where the problem with EFA is that the decisions we make based mm -hmm. on it could be the result of uh, just a lot of subjectivity. Yes, the problem with EFA is it's inherently subjective. Yeah. And yep. the thing with uh, CFA is uh, it's, it's more like, it's, it feels more sciencey. <laughs> uh, it feels more here, sciencey. Yeah, you have I like that. And you test it against data if it fits, then, you know, great. But if it doesn't, then you can figure out what the problem is. Yeah, exactly. It's, it's disconfirmable. You, you have, you can make an argument, the data can support it or not, but most likely not, and when that happens, it gives you extra information as to why not that you can then choose to incorporate to re rethink your model. Okay, and are rotations uh, only a CFA thing? Yes, rotation oh. is not a thing anymore in CFA. Oh, right. It's completely unnecessary to choose a rotation for interpretability if you know what your factor is supposed to mean in the first place because you've specified which items measure it and which ones don't. Yep, the interpretability comes from your model specifying things. Yep, uh, question? What if, you, what if you aren't in control for specifying the factors and questions, if someone just comes to you with a bunch of questions that seem to be unrelated, they say, help me find patterns, <laughs> what would you do? Uh, so the question was, what if I'm not in control and I just get a dump of data mm -hmm. and someone says, help me fix it? Um, that has actually happened. Um, I would say step one is to read the items and see what, I mean, just from a layperson's perspective, like which ones go together in some kind of way. Step two is look at a correlation matrix. The items that are correlated have a shot at measuring something in common. The items that aren't correlated don't have a shot at measuring something in common. And you can start from that, I think, as a reasonable place to make a model. Um, you know, alternatively, load up all of your items into one factor and see if it fits. And if not, then the diagnostic information as to how you went wrong can help you come up with a different plan. Okay. 
And in that instance, I would absolutely want to collect another sample of data and then start with the revised structure because it's cheating, essentially, if you refine the model on the same data. Of course it's going to fit because you made it fit. The question is, is what you came up with replicable across samples that would be similar in composition? I can see people trying to reverse engineer about that, though. Mm -hmm. Like, I don't want to do it again. Well, I think that it's... It's a question of how you use the word confirmatory. The way that I'm referring to it is the process of data analysis using this confirmatory framework in which we get a yes or no answer, does this model fit? But revising the structure heads it into kind of more exploratory territory, but you're using, you're exploring in a confirmatory way. Okay. I don't know if that helps at all, but that, that's kind of how I think of it. It's, it's not black and white, but there is no way in EFA other than like, there's like one rotation, what is it, Procrustes or something, there's like one way to sort of put some kind of structure on it, but for the most part, it's just a free-for-all. Okay, anything else? Uh, quick question. Yeah. Generally, when you're doing consulting, uh, how do, I mean, I think I have an answer, but I'm just asking, how do people usually respond if you tell them nicely that, uh, when you're using exploratory EFA or such techniques, the patterns you see could be an artifact of the methods you're using and not whether there's actually a signal there. The, so the question was, if I'm doing consulting and someone's done an EFA, how do I break the news to them that I don't like it, essentially? Yeah, something like that. Like, something you know, like they that. They could be, like, what's a nice word? They could be fooling themselves. My... I think that they could come up with a structure post hoc, right? The computer's doing all of it, you know, look at the different rotations, and they can come up with a story that makes their solution make sense because social scientists are very good at making up stories once they see what happens with the data. The question is whether they could defend the solution that they landed on as better than some other possibility, and from the... the principal axis matrix decomposition version of EFA, the answer is no. That's where I come back to. It's like, how do you know you have four factors? Well, because it makes sense. I can make three factors make sense. Um, so that's, that's my problem with it, and that's what I would explain to them. It's like, well, let's, let's actually fit the model and see if you're right, that, that these are the four factors or whatever it is. So. What if they're like just giving you a significant result? Well, there are no significance tests in EFA. The, the whole purpose of EFA is to try to figure out the underlying structure of what's in common for your items. There, I mean, there, there are no... Only doing EFA with maximum likelihood would you get a significance test, but you get one chi-square and nothing else to work with that tells you... It'll say up or down, but chi-square is almost always going to be significant, which in this context is bad. It's the lack of further information that makes it problematic. So rather than going through like this is how we do EFA and here's an example, I think it's, it will be easier to see why I think it's less useful once you have the alternative and then you see what that involves. And then maybe you will find it dissatisfying or maybe you won't. We're all entitled to our opinions. Okay. Anything else before we dive in to some new stuff? <laughs> So I'm laughing because my earlier class was very similar. Everyone's looking a little like today. Are we okay? Yeah, yeah we're okay. We're going to make it. I know uh, late or middle afternoon is not good for some people. Morning's not good for some people. It's funny. I've taught at all different times of the day, and the one commonality I always receive is at least one person on my evaluation says the time of the class didn't work for them. That's the one thing that I can count on. The funniest thing that I ever had with respect to that was um, at KU, when the Royals won the World Series, I had a class that was going to be like the next day, and the class started at noon. And I had a student tell me like the day before that he, he was not going to make it to class. Like, he just knew it. And I thought, it's noon, dude. Like, I don't know how much you're partying the night before, but noon? <laughs> Come on. So, Yeah. I, I found that very amusing, but at least he was honest. Um, that same game, I remember there was like an eight-year-old boy 
in, uh, in the stands, and he had a giant billboard that he made, and it said something like, Mrs. Smith, I'm going to be tardy tomorrow. Like, <laughs> like yeah, you know, own it, right? I'm just going to be late, right? But his school probably started at 8 o'clock, not noon. So. Anywho, it's 226. We're making it work. That's what we're doing. Cheers. And yeah, I, feel sorry. free to bring in whatever coffee you need to make this work. This is reminding me, I worked at uh, Suffolk University in Boston, and like it's right off the common. And so anytime a sports team won something major, i.e. the Patriots or the Red Sox, like our campus was split across the parade route. And so mm. basically like classes like four hours before and four hours after, <laughs> like you could not get across the street because of no. all the parades. That's a new one. Red Sox won. Sorry, class is canceled. Yep. Yeah, that's Oh, we don't, we don't the have university that here. said classes aren't canceled, but then, of course, the professors were like, yeah, yeah we're not meeting. <laughs> yeah, good luck. So we're just I telling have, stories. That's what we're doing today. I Sorry. actually have a curious question about, like, the end of the semester uh, surveys. Okay. Because it's, how do they report those? To like, us? Yes. Do they use, like, factor analysis, or do they just kind of... <laughs> <laughs> That's a good one. <laughs> I feel like nobody really understands. No. We we get um, descriptive statistics, so we get, you know, things like means and medians, and then we get things like department means and department means of medians, and I'm not even sure what all the columns mean, to be honest, because there's, like, a mean of a median and a median of a mean, I think. (laughs) I'm serious. Like, there are different columns that mean these things. Um, And then we also get an Excel sheet that has the individual responses, so, like, you can see if someone nuked you across the board on all your items, uh, de-identified, of course. And then we just get, like, a dump of all the um, open-ended questions for each question. Have you ever done, like, done a, a model or fit a model to? <laughs> Good luck getting your hands on that. Too. Yeah. <laughs> so, no, I have not done factor analysis on um, end-of-semester student evaluations. However, that is something that Jonathan wants to do. So I'm not sure yeah. if, if you know about that, but that was he's actually, like, gone to the steps to try and get the data because one of the issues in end-of-semester end evaluations is bias as a function of the teacher. So there's literature suggesting that teachers who have certain characteristics like being female or being a person of color or what have you are penalized differentially. Um, and the problem with that is that it's hard to separate out, you know, what is the effect of like me having those characteristics versus like the content that I'm teaching and the students who have to be there versus who are the students and who bothered to respond Like, to do it right, you would need, like, a giant multi-level model where you could keep track of the characteristics of the individual respondents, the characteristics of the instructor, the characteristics of the classes, and you'd have to do it over multiple semesters so that you could pull apart, like, what is the ELISA effect as opposed to the female effect as opposed to the stats effect, right? Like, all of these things are confounded into one set of numbers. So, yes, factor analysis then could help you do some of that multi-level factor analysis is what you would need to do in that in this case because of the different dimensions of sampling. Course evaluations are also highly political in terms of like their supposed use of like evaluating uh, um, as instructors, and mm-hmm. then um, there's like a lot of like replication of like oh this like similar questions across institutions, and then you've got like products where like we will implement your course evaluation um, in items and whatnot. Yeah. So I was a little in- interesting in the fact that they actually have like a committee that like vets the items that are going to go on it and whatnot. Mm-hmm. Well, in theory, universities are supposed to, I think, have people who are responsible for looking at the content of the items and making sure that, that they're good questions. But like there was one question at KU I remembered. It was something triple-barreled like, The instructor is available when you need them, understandable when they talk, and organized or something. And it was like one of those questions like, oh, I can imagine not knowing how to answer this in certain cases, right? Because someone can be very good about one but not good about the other. And yeah, so anyway, those are a whole nother thing. They're certainly not unidimensional the way that they're used, I don't think. I think there's a lot of different dimensions that the questions are trying to get at. So anywho. Uh, models? 
No, no. Maybe? Stories are good, though. I will, I will tell stories throughout the, the course of, of modeling, so I like the stories. It's good to be able to relate it to things that we care about. Of course, I've been talking so long, my mouse has lost its will to live. There we go. Come back, Mr. Mouse. All right, so here's our model. It's deceptively simple. This is it. And I'm using color deliberately. In this case, it's not the same colors as, as in the model for the means, model for the variance, but I'm, I'm coloring each thing so that when you see them in the equations, they'll sort of pop out as distinct. But what we're looking with here is a linear model where I am predicting item responses. So we're not adding items up anymore. The trait is a separate thing. So in this class, the notation goes like this. I is for item and S is for subject. So this is an, one equation that is summarizing as many separate equations as we would have item responses. So that's why we have different subscripts on each term, because the question is, is this term related to which item it is, or is it related to which person it is, or both? So this model, our confirmatory factor analysis, or CFA, has two item parameters in it. This mu-looking thing here with an I, that's my intercept. And this lambda-looking thing with an I, that is my factor loading. That is the term that people will call, it is a slope. Then E plays the role of the residual or the error term that you're used to. Because which item it is and which person it is can only explain so much of the variability. E is whatever is left. So we have the intercept, the subject's F score, which again, F is what I can draw reliably. I think your textbook uses squiggle one for that, which I think, do we see that with psi last time? Does that sound right? Okay, I'm gonna learn them eventually. Maybe when I retire. And then weighted by the item-specific loading here, and then E. So if I map this onto linear regression, it is literally the same. The only difference is what the predictor entails. In linear regression, the predictor is an observed variable that's in your data set. In this, it's not. It's F. It's latent. And people will call it, let's see, we'll go through our list, latent factor. Let's do some more. Ability. Uh, ability, I'll take that. Latent trait. Latent trait. Latent characteristic. Latent characteristic. Yep, keep going. Factor score. Factor score. True score. True score. Data, data's coming, yep, in about uh, six weeks or so. Yep, did I miss any? Latent variable, latent factor, latent trait, latent ability. Uh, yeah, all those words, right? I'm going to go with a latent factor, I think, through most of this, because I'm trying to keep the terminology consistent, but just know that all of those words would work too. Question? So who had the audacity to call it true score? <laughs> it's true because it's not error okay. yeah it's I don't know I'm sure there's a reason but I don't know what it is the true score I'm just I'm trying to link it to how you would hear about it in certain classical test theory contexts no, I, I think it's just a random y like equals t random. plus e t is what f is supposed to be yeah right. okay Fair enough. So then if we put our linear regression hat on, then what I used to call beta zero is now beta zero I in this case because it's per item. So that's the intercept. That's my expected item response when I have a factor score of zero. In most of the models that we will look at, zero is the mean of the factor score distribution. Not always, but most of the time. And it is because then the value of the item intercept is the item mean. So it makes it an easy interpretation. But it is conditional. So this is why when people talk about this as an item mean, sort of shortcutting that translation, it's not correct. A mean is unconditional. An intercept is conditional. These model parameters, this is a conditional mean, conditional on f of zero. That allows us to compare across samples with different distributions of factor scores. Because as long as we have an anchor point for f of zero, then we can talk about them on the same scale. A uh, quick notation question. Do they yep. usually use mu? Yeah. 
Sometimes it's other things, but it seems like that's most common. But that could also contribute to the mm -hmm. calling it a mean, because in other contexts, it's a mean. Yeah, well, it becomes a mean if the mean of f is zero when you set up the model. But it's not always going to be that way, which is why I'm, I'm like, no, it's intercept, it's conditional. Yeah. How does the equation change if you're working through an item response pattern and not like individual responses? Uh, this model is concerned about individual responses. Okay, but, so it'd be a completely different. It, but the way that we're going to actually estimate it is based on patterns. But this is sort of the, the theory of like what the factor is supposed to be doing and how you would interpret the item parameters that you get out of your solution. So that's why I'm starting with this as the beginning. Okay, so intercept, expected item response when f is zero. Slope is the lambda. So factor loadings are slopes. And they mean the same thing as a slope does. It is the change in y for a one unit change in x. So it's the change in the item response for a one unit change in f, and that's why I have taken the word change out of here and substituted difference. Because Fs do not change. Each person has an F. So when I say like a one unit difference in F, I'm saying if I compare the expected item response from a person with an F of zero versus a person with an F of one, the slope covers that distance. So to some it's a semantic distinction. To me it's not because I teach longitudinal. And change is really change then as opposed to differences. So these are differences between people that we're talking about. A one unit difference in F corresponding to this much difference in Y. And then E is our friend error or residual. Now typically I say residual because error makes it sound like you did something wrong, um, but you didn't. In this class, however, the term residual is going to take on a it's conceptually similar but different enough that it gets confusing. Like you will get a piece of output, for instance, that is called a residual covariance matrix. It is not the correlation of the E's like you would think it is. It is a discrepancy matrix of how far off the model predicted correlations are from the actual ones in the data. So the term residual means like offness as a, in terms of model versus data. And so I'm going to try to stay away from it as a name for this parameter and call it E instead. Okay, with me so far? Okay, so this is the general idea. We don't have F. It isn't going to stop us. We're going to go try and find it. Oh, can, I'm sorry. Yeah, go for it. So this equation is for one item. Uh, it's for all the items. For like, all the items. Yeah, so that's what the I subscript is. It's like in stack data. It's like how right, 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 right. Mm -hmm. So like... Item one would be one line, item two would be another line, yes. item three would be one line. Yes. Earlier you were talking about better items. Uh-huh. Um, does that show up in this equation? Like, for example, does like the lambda value change if you have like a better item? Yes. Great. Okay, cool. That's where I'm going next. Oh, yes. Nice. Thank you for foreshadowing <laughs> so nicely. I love it when the slides like, you know, head into that direction. Let me answer your question. Why, well, yes, the loading is your item discrimination. Better items have stronger slopes. They are more related to the latent trait. Figuring out just how related it is is one of the jobs of the model, trying to figure out what the most optimal value is for the loading of each parameter, as well as the most optimal value of the intercept, which becomes our indicator of location, difficulty, or severity. Now, just like in classical test theory, it's backwards because items that have higher intercepts have a higher expected response at a factor score of zero, which means they're actually easier or easier to endorse, however you want to think about it based on your trait type. Um, but keep in mind that it's conditional. So in this case, we have separated out um, how high the item mean is based on the sample versus the intercept, which is conditional on f of zero. So this is the expected item response for somebody with average ability in most cases. That's going to be my intercept here. It's not just the overall mean of the item for the sample. However, the Brown textbook and many other, I would say, earlier references don't even have this intercept in the equation. It's not even going to be there until like chapter 8 or something. And here's why. So under the idea that this is fundamentally a linear model, According to CFA, 
the relationship between the latent factor predictor and the observed item response is linear. One slope covers the whole thing. So according to that perspective, an item that has a high loading or a high slope is a good item because it discriminates people of different ability levels have different expected item responses. A bad item has a zero slope. So thus the smiley unhappy faces here. Can you guess what a negative slope would mean? Yeah. That doesn't make sense. Exactly. Negative means, oh, problem. Big problems. Either some sort of coding error or it's measuring it backwards and you really need to go look at that item more carefully. Negative item discrimination is never good. One of the things that we will do as a pre-step to fitting these models is to do any reverse coding needed so that more is higher. You can, in theory, have a mix of items that would be negatively related and positively related, but then the trait doesn't know which way is up, and it can cause estimation problems. So we're setting it so that higher values equals more of the trait, and coding all of the items such that that should be true. So before doing any analyses, we would reverse code any items that are negatively worded as needed. So because of this idea that all you need to know is the loading, Historically, the intercepts don't get taken into account. It doesn't really matter where it crosses the y-axis because it's a linear slope. But we are keeping them for a couple of reasons. Number one, because it's in the model. And number two, because whenever we make comparisons across samples or time, we need them. And number three, because every other factor type model has them because they have nonlinear slopes in which the, where the item is in terms of its location actually then matters. So for parallel construction with everything that follows, I'm keeping the intercepts. But traditionally, they are not used to judge how good an item is. Traditionally. The intercepts are not. They are not. The it's, it's all about the slopes. So what kind of items do you need to make your test better? More, more items that load more highly. So load is like used as a verb in that sense. The item loads on a factor. It's another way of saying the item measures the factor or that the factor is the reason why someone would respond the way that they do. The more it loads, uh, yeah. the, the steeper the slope? The more it loads, the steeper the slope, yes. Loads more highly is how people would say that. Um, yep, steeper slopes are good. That's what you got. Now it's time for pictures. So these types of models invariably are shown with some kind of diagram, and the whole world has agreed on a way to draw these pictures. Well, they just have. And if you try to change it, people get mad at you. Like, no, this is not OK. These are the rules for drawing these pictures. So there's very little creativity as part of this. The creativity comes in al aligning everything so that it all fits on one page. That's where the creativity comes in. But in these types of diagrams, the rules are the following. Things in circles are imaginary. Things in boxes are real. Things in circles are either latent variables that we don't have, or they are errors that we don't know until we fit the model. So from that perspective, they're both unknown latent things. If I haven't labeled a path, it's presumed to have a 1. But this box right here, Y1, this is my first item response. Y1 is thought to measure F1, not to measure F2. So we allow an arrow to go from F1 into the box. The direction of the arrows are critical. If you make it backwards, it does not mean the same thing. Because in these models, F is the predictor that then predicts the observed box response as the Y. If you go the other way, it turns it into a component model, or what's known as a formative indicators model. And it's a different relationship. So what this is saying is that the variability in Y1 is partly because of F1 as a predictor, and partly because I don't know. Error. So if I just had this one item, 
This is literally the same as y equals t plus e back in the world of classical test theory. If I just had one item, it's the same idea. The difference is that we get to estimate this relationship slope, this lambda 1, 1 for the first item measuring the first factor empirically. How much does it look like this item is measuring this factor? We'll find out. Is it going to say? Okay, I know what else it's going to say. The name for the variance of the E's across people. Now, you will hear lots and lots of synonyms for this, too. It's error to me. You will also hear specific variance, unique variance. Uh, the only thing I can tell you definitively is that whatever E is, it's not the factor. That's it. It could be error. It could be something also systematic, but no other item measures it, so it looks like error. You don't know. See, this reminds me of a TV show that was on for like a couple of seasons, I want to say in the early 90s, called Dinosaurs. Is anyone old enough to know what I'm talking about? A few people? So, it so let me just try and describe it. You'll, you can find it on YouTube. But it was like people in these dinosaur costumes. It was not animated. They were like real people. And the baby dinosaur uh, always used to call the dad, not the mama, in that voice. Because he would ask for something, and then the dad would come and he'd be like, not the mama! And he'd like throw something at him and stuff. Because from his perspective, there was mama and not the mama. Covered everything else. So analogously, I would say that F1 is factor, and E is not the factor. Because it doesn't matter. That's all I know. It's not the factor. Are there other things in E that are systematic? Probably. But I can't know that. So if you hear the term unique variance or specific variance, that is a nicer way of saying error. But it's not the factor. That much I do know. Okay, how are we doing? Question. Is there a way to tell if it's random error or systematic error? There no. is if you have something in common with which to pull it apart. Okay. So if you think that it's error plus something systematic, you can't get at that systematic unless something else in your item pool get, has it too. And that's why, that's why I mean like it could be unique and special, but, or it could just be error, but they're confounded if you don't have another item at least to pull it apart with. Okay. You don't know. It, and it's based on whichever items ended up in the analysis. So, so like in a test, let's say it's like a math test and it's an English language learner. Mm -hmm. Would you, if we were living in an ideal world, would you give them the question in their native language and then use that to see if it's a language issue or if it's a math issue? Um, so the question was, like, if, if I have a math problem, say if it's like a story problem that has yeah. a verbal component or something, in an ideal world, I would give questions that had only to do with reading, questions that had only to do with math, and some that had some of both. And I would try to pull those things apart because I had some items that were clearly only one factor, some items that are clearly only the other, and some items that do both. Okay. Yep. But if you have an item, let's say that you try to put together an analysis where you have a bunch of items that have no words, just math, and then a story problem. That story problem is probably not going to load as highly, and it will have probably more, relatively more error variance because of measuring something else that the others don't. But all we can say is not the factor. Because okay. we don't know what the other stuff in it is, unless we can find a way to operationalize it. Yep. What does factor variance mean? The variability across, factor, across people in what the Fs would be. So F is a random variable. We don't, it doesn't have a scale yet, because it's imaginary. But we believe that each person has a different F. And so F has a distribution. And all we need to know to be able to make this worth mathematically is what is the mean of F supposed to be and what is its variance. And then if we have more than one F like this, we also have a covariance between them. Note the two-headed arrow for this line right here. Two-headed arrows mean bidirectional, direction agnostic relationships, known as covariances. Uh, sometimes people call this a correlation. Strictly speaking, that's in the standardized solution, but it's the same idea. 
I'm saying that where you are on F1 is allowed to relate to where you are on F2. Does that help? The, what the variance is? Yeah, it's across people. So this E1 variance is the error, not the factor variance, of item 1 across people. E2 is across people. E3 is across people. So items are fixed effects in this design. There, are no, there is no variance across items because each item gets its own set of parameters that would totally soak up all of the random variability across items. Yes? So would the goal be to maximize the factor covariance then to make sure that there's a mm. crossover? No, not necessarily. Okay. Whether we have a covariance or not is up to you. Okay. In certain kinds of models, you can't have a covariance because it, then it won't be identified. Um, whether these, this is two factors that these items are measuring or one factor becomes an empirical question as to whether in the standardized solution, if this correlation is one, then you don't have two things. Oh, so that's the opposite. Yeah, that's the way that people use it, is to argue, am I measuring two things or one thing? And if the correlation is lower than one, it's two, at least to some extent. Yeah, that's a hypothesis test you can ask, is whether the model fits better if you add two factors versus one, as part of the way to, to argue against this. Okay, 252. Not quite done yet, but holding in there. All right, so we got the loadings. We got the factors and their covariance. Now we have the stupid triangle thing. A convention that I really dislike, but it's the only way to put the intercepts and the means in the picture, is to pretend that they come from a vector of ones, like it would be if you wrote out your model in matrix form, the intercept is a column of ones. So because this isn't a variable, it doesn't get put in a circle or a box, it's a constant, and so people settled on triangle. I think it just clutters up the diagram. Um, but this is the convention that you will see is the stupid triangle. So I have the intercepts for each item on the, as coming off of the triangle, as well as these K-looking things. Kappa, I want to say. Does that sound right? Greek kappa? That's what I was going for anyway. Those are the factor means. Yes, sir? Um, so can you repeat again what the point of the intercept was again in B1? So the intercept is a reflection of allowing the item's expected value to not be zero, right? So it puts it onto whatever scale the item is measured on. Um, to put it in the diagram, though, they, they have to find a way to introduce the idea of an intercept because it's not a prediction, right? It doesn't come from the factor or the error. And because the intercept is a column of ones, it doesn't, it's not a variable. So it wouldn't make sense to put it in a circle or a box. And so triangle is the compromise. And the C is making you the items and the factors. Yes, because the factors have means and the items have intercepts. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yep. These are all the possible parameters. In order for this model to be mathematically solvable, some of them have to be nailed down to fixed constants. But these are all the ones that are up for grabs. Yes. Does the, does the one have like any actual meaning? Uh, it's the way that if you multiply it, you end up with an intercept is the best I got. Um, yeah. So to me, like to, to try, try to describe to a reader, for instance, like what does my model look like? This picture is enough without this thing in the way. I think it just makes it more complicated because every item has a mean to it, right? You know that from the data. So in terms of like the difficulty in trying to figure out what these are, it's super easy to figure out what the intercept should be. It's much harder to figure out what the loading needs to be because F is imaginary. So in an IRT sense, would kappa be uh, Theta mean. Okay. Yep. True score mean, latent variable mean, latent factor mean, et cetera, et cetera. Sorry, and you said that was K? Uh, yep, that's, that's my, my K looking thing here. Is, it, is that set to zero? Sometimes. Uh, not all of, so caveat up here, you can't find all of these things at the same time. Some of them have to be set to things for this to work, but these are all the possibilities. So one other distinction that I want to make is a labeling convention for the sets of parameters. The measurement model, as a term, encompasses all of the parameters that are item-specific. 
So an intercept, a factor loading, and an error variance across people are the three parameters that each item can have in this framework. The structural model encompasses all of the parameters related to the factors, their means, their variance, and if there's more than one, any covariances. So these terms will show up periodically throughout the semester, particularly when testing invariance. So the idea of whether the items work the same way across groups, that concerns the measurement model parameters most importantly. If an item functions equivalently across groups, it should have the same intercept, the same factor loading, and the same residual variance across groups. And any differences between the groups would be relegated up to the structural model, the factor level instead. So groups could differ in their amount of F or their variability in F. Groups should not differ in the item parameters if the items are measuring the trait in the same way across groups. Okay. Lots of questions today. This is good. I More? have a question. What if you have, what if you expect different results, I guess, in different contexts? So like you were talking about like, you need to like validate across contexts. Mm -hmm. And like, what do you do in the instance where like, you actually expect it to be different? Mm. So the question was, if you're evaluating how a skill works across different contexts and you don't think that the item should work the same, you can incorporate that into the model. So ideally, most of the items should have the same parameters, but not all of them. And any item that doesn't function the same, you can let it have different parameters across groups. The problem is that the more of those you have, the harder and harder it becomes to say you're measuring the same latent thing. So it's more of a validity argument at that point than a reliability argument. But like, let's say that you have an item that for some people just isn't relevant. So I was listening to a talk, a job talk one time, I think it was, yeah, it was Nebraska, um, where someone was talking about parenting behaviors and they were doing cross-cultural research about this. And she told a story about, I think it was in Mexico, uh, one of the items that she administered had something to do with how often a parent used time out. And what she had said is that in the culture she was working with, they were like, what the hell is time out? Like, that's not a thing. So that question, like they would have said, I don't use timeout because we don't do that here, as opposed to I don't believe in timeout, which is a different thing. So in that case, like we might allow that item to not even have a loading in the culture in which it's not relevant because it doesn't measure the trait for those people. That's, op that's an option. Or if you have like any time that something is just not applicable for one group of people, you can say that item doesn't measure that trait in that group. That's a lot. Yes. And like, I'm also wondering about the items that like, we do actually think it's applicable and we think it's different. Mm -hmm. Then you can let the loadings and the intercepts be okay. different. Mm -hmm. So if you have, um, for instance, uh, problematic behavior and you have a, a model across children of different ages and you have an item like this child bites someone else, right? That's less of a problem for a two-year-old to engage in biting than a 20-year-old. So the biting item could have a stronger loading in older children who presumably should have grown out of that. That's allowed. Uh, as long as you have enough items in common to link it all back together again. So items that you believe should work the same way across groups and they do. Then you're allowed to have some fuzziness on the other ones. So this gives me a bunny to data synthesize maybe, but we went over this but what if they don't, what's the items don't have the same response type and you want to mm. combine them together? So the question was, what if the items don't have the same response type? Uh, do you see anything in this formula that cares what kind of response type it is? Yeah, this is, so what this model is for is what kind of responses do you think? We talked about this the first week of class. Continuous, Continuous items. And how do I know that? There's nothing in the formula that gives me boundaries. So the higher F goes, the wire Y goes, the end. The lower F goes, the lower Y goes, the end. It's a linear model. So what you learned in terms of what type of data regression is for with normal residuals and it's continuous and unbounded, yeah, that's what this is for. Mm-hmm. 
I have yet to see an item format that actually works that way. Everything has a boundary of some kind, at least on one end. So. But the beauty is, if you're willing to be like, it's fine, it's close enough, this is super easy to estimate. Everything is conditionally normal, slap a multivariate normal likelihood function on that, you have answers in seconds. Yeah, you do. I yeah. don't like it. You don't like it? I don't either. That's why I don't teach my class this way. Traditional SEM classes do CFA and then they go on to SEM and they pretend everything is normal and most of our item responses don't work this way. And so that's why I'm deliberately pursuing a generalized version of like, well, if you have a continuous item, this is what you do. If you have a binary item, this is what you do. If you have an ordinal item, this is what you do. Like, you can have any kind, but this formula is for continuous, plausibly normal items. And furthermore, it's not even conditionally normal because we assume that F is normal. So the only way that you can end up with an E that's normal and an F of normal, then Y is normal too. So marginally normal, not just conditionally in this case, even stronger than usual. Okay, Zoomers, are you still with me? I haven't had any chats in a while. I'm watching though. Let's see if, they're, see if they respond. Zoomers, are you with me? Some of them are. We'll find out. All right. Okay, 302, getting there. Uh, okay, let's see if there's anything else I wanted to say about the picture. Nope, just pay attention to the arrows from the factor into the box, from the error into the box, from the stupid triangle thing into, into each box and circle as well. Yes? So, that the item should act equally between groups, so we could, how could we uh, measure the differential item functions in this context? In this context, differential item functioning is called measurement non-invariance, and it is the same way that you would do it in an IRT context. You would say, like, if I have this model and I have this in one group versus another, I would put constraints that say lambda 1, 1 has to be the same in this group and that group. Lambda 2, 1 has to be the same. All of them have to be the same. And compare the fit of the model where they're all the same versus they get to be whatever they want. And if the model where they are forced to all be the same isn't worse, you win. Then they're the same. Yeah. So in IRT, we are differentiating the, uh, the groups to the... Discrimination mm -hmm. That's the loading. Lambda. Yep. Well, that is that is a discrimination parameter. That's what I would call it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Like the idea of discrimination, not just tied to a particular version of it. Discrimination means how well the item relates to the tree. It is operationalized in this model as lambda. It's an item total correlation if you're in classical test theory. It is actually called discrimination, which is A in IRT. But the idea is more general. Yep, and just like you in, um, you can have a uniform diff and non-uniform diff. You can have the lambda be different between groups, the intercept be different, or both. They just they they do have special names, but I don't want to go there yet, because <laughs> that's a whole nother set of names. I know it's a lot of words, and that's why pe people like Jonathan prefer equations, because then the words are just like, well, what do you mean by that? You write an equation. Oh, I know what you mean by that. Assuming the equation's good. All right. So two different versions of these model parameters you will see in your output. One is unstandardized and one is standardized. So they tell you the same information on different scales. Unstandardized is in the form of the regression model. So an unstandardized solution, what it's trying to do is recreate the item means, the item variances, and the item covariances with these model parameters. That's what it's trying to do. I know that sounds crazy, but I'll show you how it works in just a couple slides. So that means that all of these elements are on the scale that you're talking about. So if I told you that the item intercept is 2, your answer should be on a scale of what? Does it start at 2? Is that the lowest? Or does it go from 1 to 3? Does it go from 1 to 5? Like, what's 2? you got to know what the scale is. Similarly, the lambda is scale dependent, so I need to know what is the standard deviation of f and what's the standard deviation of y, excuse me, to know what one unit means in terms of that. 
I will note that there is an asymmetry in how these parameters are going to be given to you. What you will get on your output is directly the intercept for each parameter. You get an estimate, standard error, blah, blah, blah. You will get a loading for each item, but you won't get an E because E is a person-specific quantity. What you will get is the E variance across people. So to put the predict how these things predict the variance of Y back together again, it's the variability of the E's is actually the model parameter. And then the rest of it is how much of the variability is due to the factor is this part. It becomes the squared loading times the variance of the factor. So we're back to the idea of reliability. How much of the total variability is due to the true score part? That's this here in brackets. And then how much is due to the error? Then we also get standardized, in which case we assume that we are working with z-scored outcomes. So then all we're talking about is correlations. And in this case, we end up with standardized loadings that also convey how related the factor is to the item, but a standardized loading is in a correlation metric. So if I told you the unstandardized loading is six, you'd have to, okay, what, what's your scale? What are you talking about? If I told you the standardized loading is 0.7, you would immediately know, okay, that's how correlated this item is. 0.7 squared means that 0.49, so the item, half of it is related to factor, and the other 51% is not the factor, whatever the hell that is. So we always square the loadings to talk about sort of the variance that's due to the trait, and then whatever's not due to the trait is due to not the factor. Yeah? The PZ score, then you're assuming that the factors are normally specifically. You're assuming that anyway. Okay, yeah. So it's, it's Z scoring the responses, not the factors necessarily. Okay. Yeah, but it's putting all of the items onto the same scale. And so the benefit of doing that is that then you can compare across items and see which item is better because they're all on the same scale of possible correlation. So the standardized loadings do allow you to compare the relative amount of information each item is providing. Otherwise, the unstandardized slopes, you have to know what the scales are to make comparisons. So we will tend to look at the original solution, but then to interpret which items are good, head down to the standardized solution in a correlation metric. All right, so this picture, if you're like, yeah, I don't like pictures, okay, you like the equations better. That's the system of equations that picture is trying to tell you about. So writing out the equation for what is being predicted for each of my items according to that picture. So I've got the first subscript is the item number still with an S because this is the item response across subjects. Each item has its own intercept. And note that each item has only one intercept regardless of how many factors are in your story. It's the expected outcome when whatever predicts it is zero. Then each item, because there are two factors in the model, has the potential to have two loadings. In the picture I drew, each item either loads on F1 or F2, but not both. So this is what I mean by confirmatory. Like this is up to me to decide a priori based on what the items are supposed to measure. Did you have a question? Yeah. Okay. Um, so, so the first, the Y first means this is the first item, right? Yes. Is, does this mean the same subject or does it mean this apply to different? So S is for subject. So this describes the distribution of Y1 responses across subjects. Oh, across different subjects. Across different subjects, yeah. So I'm unpacking the one combined equation into separate ones to show you what each one gets. So according to the picture, this part right here, the first item loads on F1. So item one has a loading of, on F1, that's why it's one, one, then two, one, then three, one. But the first three items do not load on F2. That's what I'm saying. The opposite is the case for items four, five, and six. They don't load on F1, but they do load on F2. So this structure 
automatically, without even having any numbers on it, is postulating that items one, two, and three are going to be more related because they have this trait in common than they are going to be related with four, five, and six. Four, five, and six together are going to be more related. So across factors, we would expect a lower relationship between one and four than we would between one and two. So this choice as to what loads on what is setting up an expectation of the covariance pattern. That's where this is headed. Each of them has usually a separate error variance per item. We don't usually do anything with that, although you can. And intercepts are also usually estimated separately in most cases. Because this system of equations can get very tedious to write out, people tend to do it in matrices instead. So you can write all of this in matrix form in which y, a matrix of intercepts and a matrix of the E variances are all six by one because we have six items and there's only one of each of these things. Lambda would be six by two because each item has the potential for two different loadings. And F is two by one because there's two different factors. So it's 312, but just to show you where we're headed in case anyone's curious, is this, fun with matrices. And if you're like, yeah, Lisa, I don't know how to do matrices. Yeah, join the club. I don't either. But at some point, it helps to see how the math actually works out in terms of how these loadings are being put in. So like, for instance, this part right here, which we'll talk about next week, I've got the loadings for the first three items on factor one, zero loadings on factor two, and vice versa here. So you end up with this model implied matrix where each element is a function of the loadings, the error variances, the factor variances. It's a pattern. And all of the items that are within the same factor are predicted to have more relationship because they're in common than items from different factors. The only reason why items on different factors are supposed to be related is because of the covariance. So if you picture this idea of relationships, like if I want to say how related is item one and two, I would say, well, it's a function of this loading and that loading. How related is item one and six? That loading, that covariance, and that loading. So then whether you're right boils down to, okay, what are the actual covariances in the data? What does your model say they should be? How close are you? Close enough, you win. Not close, try again. But that's Thursday. That's where we're headed. All right, how are we doing? So this to me, even though there's the difficulty in this material in particular is that we're used to thinking about the idea of prediction you know, in equations like this, like we're talking about, you know, how much variance and why do the predictors account for? That's not really the point here. The point here is to evaluate, like, how can we recreate the variances and covariances with this model, not explain why this person is higher than this other person. So it's a different way of thinking about it. It takes some getting used to. But. All right. Uh, office hours today at 3.30 on Zoom. Tuesday, you get to meet my basement. If you haven't seen it before, we will all be on Zoom together there. And that's it. Let me know if you need anything. Thanks for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Hang on. Uh, so